Hello again, this is the Pencrest High School AP Physics 1 video series. This is video 4C, uh, Universal Gravitation. So now we're going to look at the law uh, for which Newton is um, best known, uh, the law of universal gravitation. Um, we've all heard the mythical version. He was sitting under an apple tree and the apple fell on his head. Somehow he was inspired to uh, discover gravitation. It's not exactly how it happened, but it does make for a nice story. Uh, the truth of the matter is it does deal with objects that fall. Uh, but what Newton really wondered was if um, whatever this force was that made objects fall when you drop them uh, was the same force that kept the moon moving in a circular path around the Earth. Um, at the time, the concept of uh, force at a distance was not uh, universally accepted. Um, forces that we're familiar with, like tension and contact forces and normal force and friction, uh, these are created by objects that are in contact with other matter. Um, the idea that a, that a an object could exert a force on another object without touching it um, was difficult to to imagine and difficult to sustain at the time. <clears throat> now he ended up doing a lot of mathematics. Uh, he used um, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which we're going to see a little later, um, and he ultimately um, discovered that. It was, in fact, the same force um, that was making things fall. Um, was the same force that was keeping the moon in a, a circular orbit around the Earth, at least mathematically. <clears throat> so here's what the law of universal gravitation says. Um, any two masses separated by some distance R are going to exert a force of attraction on each other and the magnitude of this force uh, is directly proportional to the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them so this means the force is bigger if the masses are bigger uh, the force is smaller if the distance is bigger <clears throat> uh, the direction of this force is along uh, a line uh, that connects the centers of the two objects, the two masses. Uh, the force is always attractive. Um, you can think of it visually um, the same way we represented tension at either end of a rope. So pulling inward at, at, both, side, at both ends. Now, uh, this law is said to be universal uh, because it applies to any two masses anywhere in the universe at any time. Um, if you consider these two masses here, um, M1 and M2, the force of attraction between them, again, it acts along this dotted line that connects the two centers. Um, the magnitude is given by this formula in the red box. Uh, it is on your formula sheet. Um, but very simply, uh, Fg equals big G times M1, M2 over R squared. Now, F sub G, we already know what F sub G means. That's the gravitational force. M1 and M2 are the masses of the two objects. R is the distance between them. And uh, big G here is a constant. Um, we do want to emphasize the, the difference between big G and little g. Little g we know is the acceleration, local acceleration due to gravity. This big G is a universal gravitational constant. It has a, a, a value that's very well known. Um, big G equals 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. We have either Newton meters squared per kilogram squared, or on your formula sheet it's written as meters cubed per second squared times kilograms. Um, the units are equivalent. Um, this version in the red box appears on your formula sheet. In fact, we know <clears throat> we know the value of 
the universal gravitational constant to much more precision than I'm showing here. But again, we typically use three significant figures, so we'll go with that. And again, um, <clears throat> note that the gravitational force between these two objects, um, the forces are equal. The magnitudes are equal. You could say that M1 attracts M2 and pulls on it with this gravitational force, and M2 pulls on M1 with this gravitational force. The magnitudes are the same, opposite direction. Now this uh, relationship is going to be instrumental uh, when we look at any object that orbits any other object. Uh, we might think of a moon orbiting the Earth or orbiting a planet. Um, anything that orbits the Sun, uh, man-made satellites orbiting the Earth or any other planet. Uh, the Sun, the whole solar system, orbits around the supermassive black hole that's at the center of the Milky Way. Anything that orbits anything else we're going to need this relationship here. Now we're going to take a look at orbits here. Uh, when an object orbits another object, we, we say fundamentally that gravitation is the centripetal force. So if we look at this image, and we look at the two objects, we're going to say that M1 is a lot less massive than M2. This might be the moon and this might be the Earth. And this object is orbiting around M2 in a nice circular path. Now we know that the gravitational force acts along the line connecting the two objects. Wherever M1 is in the orbit, that gravitational force is going to be acting towards the center. So if it's up here, it's going to be pulling this way. If it's over here, it's going to be pulling this way. So it's always going to point towards the center, which is good, because the gravitational force then is the centripetal force that always points towards the center, keeps the object moving in a circular path. <coughs> now mathematically, we would say this. On the left side, this is the gravitational force formula. And on the right, we have MA for the object that's moving in the circular path. So M1 is the object that's doing the orbiting, it's doing the circular path. So very simply, this relationship that we see here, it says gravitation is the centripetal force. Now we could clean it up a little bit. Um, the M1 cancels on both sides. One of the R's goes away from this side and we get this relationship here or we could take the square root and say that the velocity of the orbiting object M1 equals big G times M2 over R. And this tells us the velocity of any satellite, whether it's natural or man-made, based on the mass of the object it orbits which is the M2, and the radius of the orbit. Notice that the mass of the satellite actually drops out. The mass doesn't actually matter. Now, <clears throat> we're going to see various types of satellites, um, moons and planets orbiting the sun and so on. Uh, we're also going to look at synthetic or man-made satellites. Now, usually they orbit very close to the surface of the central object. If I'm going to put a satellite around the Earth, it's going to be pretty close to the surface. Um, you might remember the space shuttle, although it was retired a few years ago. Um, the space shuttle used to orbit the Earth um, at an altitude of about 250 miles. It actually varied from maybe 200 up to about 600 miles. But the radius of the Earth itself is, is 4,000 miles. So the space shuttle was pretty much right, right above the surface. Um, now R, when we look at the, the R in the universal gravitational formula, the R is the distance between the centers of the two objects. So the space shuttle or any other satellite would be too small to even show up on this picture. But the Earth, 
you know, we see that when we're talking about the orbital radius of this satellite, we need to include the, the radius of the planet that it orbits. In other words, R sub E is the radius of the Earth. We have the altitude, so if we have to put a satellite at 250 miles or whatever it might be, we have the altitude is the distance above the surface here. And in order to calculate the orbital radius of the satellite, we would need to add these two, the radius of the planet plus the altitude. All right. <clears throat> now, interestingly, when, when, when you're going to put a satellite into orbit, the satellite is going to work at a particular altitude. So if we're going to put up a satellite that's going to be a reconnaissance satellite to take pictures of, uh, I don't know, missile silos in the Soviet Union, um, whatever we're, we're going to take pictures of, we need to put that satellite at a particular altitude. In other words, at a particular orbital radius. Okay. Um, now we know very well the the mass of the Earth, and we know big G to a high degree of precision. So all we need to do is bring the satellite up to that given altitude. So we know the altitude at which the satellite's going to work. We bring it up to that altitude, and then we just make sure that the, the shuttle or whatever is carrying the satellite is moving at this speed. Right? If it's moving at this speed, all we got to do then is drop the satellite. Open the doors on the space shuttle and literally drop the satellite. And the satellite will continue to fall around the Earth in this perfectly circular orbit until we decide to either decommission it or shoot it down. Now, um, one major misconception um, People are under the impression that astronauts appear to float when they're up. These are some astronauts from a shuttle mission. The astronauts appear to float uh, because there's no gravity up there. There's no gravity in space. Um, this is a misconception. Okay, There's plenty of gravity at the altitudes uh, where we put astronauts and have them orbit the Earth. There's, there's plenty of gravity Um at the space shuttle mission altitudes, gravity is around 8 meters per second squared, not that much less than 9.8. Um, the reason they appear to float around like there's no gravity is because the, the space shuttle itself is falling around the Earth, just like our satellite from the previous picture. The space shuttle is a couple of hundred miles up, and it's literally falling around the Earth whole thing is in free fall including the astronauts inside it so they appear to be weightless because the whole thing is actually falling um, similar idea if if you happen to be in an elevator that was at the top floor and the cable broke the entire elevator with you inside would then be in free fall okay inside the elevator you would you would feel weightless assuming the elevator didn't have any windows you wouldn't know why okay you could make a reasonable assumption that you were falling um, but anything in the elevator would appear to be floating to anyone who was inside the elevator. From outside the elevator, everything in the elevator would appear to be accelerating downward. So the same principle applies to the astronauts in the space shuttle. All right. So that's enough for universal gravitation. We'll talk about uh, planetary mechanics next. And until then, enjoy. I'll see you again soon.